I'm Jag Singh from Medscape Cardiology. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm especially delighted today. I'm joined by Dr. Jared Bunch, uh, who's a professor of medicine uh, at the Utah University of Utah Health Science Center and also the director of electrophysiology there. Uh, welcome, Jared. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an absolute delight because, you know, especially today, we're going to be talking about a topic that is, you know, I would say uh, very topical, but also fairly concerning. Uh, and, and, the, and the topic is largely atrial fibrillation and dementia or atrial fibrillation and cognitive dysfunction. Jared, you know, as an electrophysiologist or a cardiologist, we are fairly casual about treating atrial fibrillation. Uh, we're quite comfortable treating it the way we treat it. But we often don't talk about the potential downstream effect like cognitive dysfunction that accompanies uh, many patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, is this really an association? I know you've done a lot of work on this front, and I look forward to your thoughts on, on what the association out here is. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. It, and it was one we wanted to answer early because we could see across th the state of Utah that there were trends of higher risk of dementia. And we knew for a long time that dementia associated with multiple strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. But when we began to explore other forms of dementia, it became critical because both dementia and atrial fibrillation are diseases of aging to understand is this what we're seeing, is it real or not? And there were a few interesting trends, no matter how we adjusted for it, it, it remains significant, but the, the highest risk of cognitive decline in dementia was actually seen in younger atrial fibrillation patients. And as patients age, that became less clear. And so I think that gave us teeth, that gave teeth to the association that this just wasn't an epiphenomenon of two diseases of aging, but actually something that had significant morbidity in our patients with atrial fibrillation. And, and shortly after we found that it was other centers, most uh, important, one most significantly in, in Rotterdam that showed the exact same thing, showing the highest relative risk of cognitive decline was in those that were younger, less than 67 years of age. So it's our younger atrial fibrillation that patients that really complain of that. And there's a variety of reasons that we think under, that explain that, but it helped uh, to give teeth to the association that what we're seeing is likely real and hopefully something that we can intervene upon. No, that's, that's really useful. You know, so, so I, you know, I looked at some of your work and you oftentimes quoted the Swiss AF registry study um, where they, you know, looked cross-sectionally across 2,000 patients or so and found that a substantial proportion of them actually had strokes. Uh, and many of them had white matter disease, or almost 99% of them had white matter disease. But, you know, and there I can understand an association that people who have undetected strokes could develop cognitive dysfunction. But is there a form of cognitive dysfunction that is unrelated to strokes that can still occur in patients who have atrial fibrillation? Yeah, we definitely see that. I think the Swiss atrial fibrillation study to me is a critical study to help us as we consider intervention because at enrollment in that trial, over 90%, actually 99% had white matter disease and that correlated with cognitive testing deficits and 20 to 25% had strokes, many of which were subclinical. So we know injury from ischemic insult occurs early, but we can, when you take people and you assess brain perfusion, whether it's through CT, whether it's through MRI, we've done this in animal studies where we've looked at reserve by challenging the brain adaptation, when patients go into atrial fibrillation, that becomes diminished. And it's, um, it's in, in, in the human work, it's particularly present in the improtemporal lobes, which are critical for memory. And that's also the areas that, where people score the best when we restore sinus rhythm. So there's a maladaption uh, with atrial fibrillation. There's a perfusion deficit. And, and when patients develop other when you lose the ability to adapt, so you develop extracranial vascular disease or intracranial vascular disease, it appears to accelerate. And the vulnerability to cognitive decline is higher when that's present. So, so there is there is something to do with the rhythm that's critical as well, independent of ischemic injury and uh, from strokes that are both clinical, subclinical. Got it, got it, it makes a lot of sense. 
you know, uh, so some of the work you've done and others have done have shown that there is this relationship between AFib uh, and different forms of dementia, right? And, and I understand the relationship with vascular dementia. I understand the relationship with senile dementia because, you know, oftentimes AFib occurs in people who are much older and they can be concomitant um, issues uh, occurring out there. But what about Alzheimer's? I mean, there's an association of AFib with Alzheimer's. So what are your thoughts on that? That was one of the most intriguing things we found early in this was, again, we, we used uh, vascular dementia really to understand if our analytics were okay. And so we expected an association there. But then we found this strong association with Alzheimer's disease and idiopathic dementias. And, um, and people have gone on to look at that. Is that a true finding or not? We found Multiple studies have shown that. Uh, there's a meta-analysis that shows it as well. But I think the answer isn't, is all things in medicine perfectly clear. Some of the work with Alzheimer's disease at Mayo Clinic showed, you know, on autopsy, you do see small strokes in people who pre with diagnosed with Alzheimer's that may have been misclassified inappropriately or there's some overlap. But Alzheimer's is a fascinating area because as we mentioned, the brain is healthier when perfusion is normal and it's predictable. And, and so a brain that's vulnerable, um, having that additional stress is likely harmful. We have looked at the role of genetic markers. You know, a lot of the work in Alzheimer's disease is through the APOE pathways. And we didn't see a strong association with that, but our studies were small. But there are critical genes such as PIDX2 in which there's an early vulnerability to fibrillation, also a potential vulnerability to ischemic injury, vascular disease. So a lot of links start coming together. Is this mediated through genetic factors? Um, is it mediated by small strokes? Is it mediated by a, a, a vulnerability perfusion deficit that may be linked to APOE? A lot of studies need to be done in this area. That, that, that is fascinating. Since you brought up the marker component out there, are there any you know, if I had atrial fibrillation, I don't have it as yet. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have it at some point in time during my lifetime, right? 25% of people above the age of 40 are going to develop their AFib over a lifetime. Um, are there any non-invasive biomarkers that can predict uh, that I'm going to have cognitive dysfunction or correlate with cognitive dys dysfunction? Not yet, uh, but we're working on that. There are a lot of the work from, from, from Harvard where you are, through Patrick Eleanor, have, have really defined markers for atrial fibrillation and early markers of risk. And those are low hanging fruit to study in association with dementia. But we've just completed a study we called the concussion atrial fibrillation study. And I don't have the data for that. But what we did is we, we found previously that the markers that we measure for concussions and magnitude of severity of concussions, we can measure in patients with atrial fibrillation and they're present and elevated suggestive of a brain injury early on, right as they first come in with atrial fibrillation. So we, have, we, we performed a study where we followed these serially with patients with atrial fibrillation at baseline, if they have a cardioversion, if they have an ablation, and how do those follow track with cognitive function? So there are numerous ones that are mildly elevated. But what's interesting as well is if you take antibodies to some of these proteins that are released from blood-brain barrier entry, the magnitude of antib antibody response also appears to correlate with progression of cognitive decline. So the way our body adapts to brain injury uh, may also have a role. So there's there are some exciting areas. No, that, that's for sure, for sure. So there will be potentially some biomarkers that are going to help guide prediction and, and preventative strategy. So on that note, you know, as, as, as electrophysiologists or as cardiologists, you know, when we look at patients with AFib, we compartmentalize ourselves. We talk about rate, rhythm, ablation, appendage occlusion, anticoagulation. Uh, and I know all of these in some form or fashion can prevent dementia if you, you know, have better rate or rhythm control or, or better, you know, anticoagulation. Is there anything else that we should be thinking as clinicians to prevent any cognitive decline out there in patients with AFib? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are. Um, now, in, 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 in the, the, the first step is to look at common risk factors with dementia. 
and atrial fibrillation. Alcohol use is one. We know alcohol abstinence lowers atrial fibrillation use. We know lower alcohol intake impacts cognition. High blood pressure management lowers risk of atrial fibrillation. In the, in a, in the, in the SPRINT trial, the SPRINT MIND trial, aggressive blood pressure control also improved cognition over time. Um, weight loss, treatment of sleep apnea, all those things uh, we can look at as we treat the patient holistically and, and really work on the risk factors, have inroads for organ function. And I think when, if I considered that as a patient with atrial fibrillation, the brain is just one organ that is displaying in organ injury. We can, we can see similar train, uh, uh, trends with macular degeneration, dry macular degeneration with uh, pancreatic function, kidney function. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities to live a healthier life with a close attention to the risk factors for atrial fibrillation and then management after you develop it. Terrific, terrific. Now, what are, you know, I, I know we just have a couple of minutes left, but I, I, this is a question I really need to ask you is, you know, some of your work uh, has shown that rhythm control and patients in normal sinus rhythm translates into better brain function, if I may say so, uh, and reduce cognitive decline. But there's this whole subset of patients, you know, who are committed to rate control, right? They're often old, they have persistent AFib, we know we can't get them back into normal sinus rhythm. How would you speak to them and uh, allay their anxiety of the potential cognitive dysfunction that may be hovering in the future? And, and, and there are multiple ways to address atrial fibrillation. I think the brain data is helping me treat it earlier. We do have emerging data that says if you're going to pursue rhythm control, whether with medicines or ablation, let's do it early. Let's do it in the first 12 months. But after that, the data is not as clear. And there is... And still, particularly amongst our primary care colleagues, there's a tendency if there's not a clear symptomatic benefit to use rate control. And we've looked at that. And what the key element to that that we found so far is one, you need to have adherence to anticoagulation to lower stroke risk. But how you manage the rate is also important. It's important to recognize that the, in atrial fibrillation, there has to be a compensation of the heart rate. It typically runs a little faster than normal. And when we saw aggressive use of rate control medications that lowered the heart rate less than 70, then we started, started and these are in patients with atrial fibrillation all the time, we started to see cognitive decline increase. And, and it's, it, conceptually, it's important to recognize that over 24 hours with aggressive rate control, there could be long pauses, you know, two to three seconds at night, periods of fast heart rate. And what happens, when it's modeled is 20 to 30% of the time the brain is, is hypotensive on the microvascular level. So in my patients that have pacemakers and my patients that I'm using medications, if they're on a rate control strategy, I'm more lenient, particularly if they start saying I've experienced some cognitive decline, I let that heart rate ride up 80, 90 on average to 100 on average, rather than particularly if they come in and their heart rate's less than 70. Got it, got it. And just in two seconds before we close, mobile technology, wearables, subclinical AFib, how you envision that field moving forward and, you know, and, and impacting some of the things we've talked about? I think this is the greatest area right now. The Heartline trial is looking at this. Can we use mobile technologies to diagnose and then alert people. And is that actionable? Do they get on anticoagulation? Do they see their doctors? Does that change outcome? But everything we've learned from the Swiss atrial fibrillation trial, from the East AFNET trial, from some of our early work is that the earlier you manage atrial fibrillation, the better. And so we're now taking that diagnosis and putting it in the hands of the consumer and, and, and alerting and, and allowing them to be part of the product, the process. So I think that this is an exciting time to say, can we really help people? Because again, at the Swiss AFib trial, everybody had brain injury when they were enrolled, when they first started. And, 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 and they probably had had atrial fibrillation a year or two or three earlier. It just wasn't apparent. And these watches and these tools will help us. So I think there's a great opportunity with them. And, and our job is in, in our field is to, to understand how to use it, how to educate people, how not to scare people, how to motivate them, 
um, how to get them in the right centers. Uh, so I think all of that is, there's an opportunity for teamwork here to, to really help people's quantity and quality of life. Amazing. You know, on that forward-looking positive note, um, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been amazing chatting with you on such an important topic. Um, and I look forward to chatting with you again and sharing some of your, your work uh, that is, I think, uh, impending publications coming around the corner. Uh, but thank you again. And until next time, take care.